Hello everyone, welcome back to today's music chat. We are um, going to talk about uh, Mr. Handel again. Yes. Yay, we were so Yay. excited about talking about <laughs> last week um, with Thine is the Glory and Judas Magdavis. And so uh, we thought, well, let's, let's, let's go right for the heart of Handel, uh, at least as the world knows him, and mm -hmm. um, talk about Hallelujah Chorus being still the Easter season. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and if you could talk about the Hallelujah Chorus, then of course you have to talk about the whole work, which was Messiah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I read somewhere where it's one of the greatest achievements of, the, of Western music, the, his work, the, uh -huh. the Messiah. So, um, so we're going to just enjoy talking a little bit more about him today mm -hmm. and, and just delving into that piece a little bit. Um, so we'll kind of start with uh, just reminding everyone what we said last week mm -hmm. about just the brief synopsis of his highlights of his life where, you know, again, he was born in Germany and was around a Lutheran tradition growing up, mm -hmm. but left Germany fairly young and, and went to Italy and, to, and he, by this time he was a young adult who knew he wanted to be in music. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, was making a reputation for himself as a fantastic keyboardist mm -hmm. and was doing some writing already, mm -hmm. composing. He went to Italy to learn about writing Italian opera. Opera, right. And, um, you know, certainly mastered that mm -hmm. craft, And but he ultimately ended up in England, as we said last week, and where he was heavily influenced by, by great writers like Purcell. Purcell. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, earlier had been influenced by Scarlatti in Italy, so there's some big names that influenced yeah. his writing. Right. So, and I guess we should, you know, we never mentioned that he was born the same Years Bach, yeah, 1685. They Definitely were just a month apart. Mm -hmm. Yes, in Germany. Yeah, uh, and yeah, no, they and yeah, and had very different lives. We know Bach stayed mm -hmm. in Germany and and was a church musician all of his life, mm -hmm. pretty much. And um, Handel traveled and and did some other things, and they never met um, in life. Although um, Bach admired Handel, I mm -hmm. understand. Uh, I'm sure probably vice versa. Vice versa. Yeah. So. And again, at that time, it wasn't as easy to, you know, go and meet some That's right. people from other yeah. places. It was uh, probably a lot more rare to be able to uh, meet those people that are. But I guess we musicians. have to say 1685 was a good year for music. Uh huh. Aren't we glad? Uh, so <laughs> what we didn't say last last year was, um, or last you know, week. he you know he ended up staying in England after he left Italy and went to England. He he stayed there and, and was naturalized later yep. as as being you know an Englishman. And, but uh, in his lifetime, he wrote 42 operas, mm -hmm. 29 oratorios. Oratorios, what we're talking about today with Messiah. Right. 16 organ concerti, 120 cantatas, trios and duets, and probably other things that aren't even listed, you know, in that, under those captions, you right. know. So, mm -hmm. many, many works. And Messiah probably, although, you know, when you look at water music and firework music and, you know, some of the other oratorios that also enjoy popularity, you know, they're really famous, but I think Messiah probably takes the cake mm -hmm. for him as, being his most well-known piece. Mm -hmm. So we thought we'd, we'd start with um, just talking about the overview, you know, how we is just a little, not a little, it's yeah. a big chorus and, and part of the Messiah's large two and a half hour work, mm -hmm. it's in there. But we sort of, to understand it, we sort of have to understand where it came from. So, the structure of the, of yeah, of so Messiah. Barbara, yeah, so Barbara, go, tell well, us. Um, First of all, the libretto was written by um, Jennings, who was Charles a, Jennings. Charles yeah. Jennings, who was uh, had had worked with Handel quite a bit writing libretto libretti, and uh, they usually collaborated on the libretto. But when Jensen handed him the libretto for Messiah, he he didn't change a thing. Mm -hmm. He was. Uh, he thought it was perfect the way it was. Now, Messiah is separated into three parts because it kind of follows the structure of an Italian opera in three acts. So um, it is. But we also could say it follows the structure, the not the structure of the Bible, but it follows the story of. The but Bible. The, the musical so, structure yeah, itself right. is taken from how he 
wrote operas. Okay. That, that three part, uh, think of Judas Maccabeus. It was so three the parts. operas were three three acts. acts. Is that mm -hmm. typical? That was how uh -huh. the operas were set up. Uh huh. And uh, if you remember Judas Maccabeus, Maccabeus was in three parts. So he used that same kind of structure. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a little bit different, a Messiah, because um, usually in an oratorio, we talked about what it was last week, but it is a, um, a musical piece that has uh, a chorus, it has a musical uh, instrumental ensemble, it has solo soloists, and usually in an oratorio there's like a narrator. One of the soloists is like a narrator who tells helps to tell the story, then there are people that represent part of the story that have arias, But then it's, it's still not a spoken narration, it's no, no, all no, done it's sung. For, when sure. we say recitative, that's sort of like a sung spoken right. Right. <laughs> yeah, part. Yeah. But if you think about opera, that's what opera does too, yeah. you know, so anyway, and so it has all of those uh, parts, but it is not a theatrical work, it is a concert. It, um, and so Messiah was written, the libretto was Jensen, um, Handel took the libretto and very quickly wrote Messiah within about 24 days, which was an amazing feat. Um, some people may say that uh, he was totally inspired, but he really did, and, and I, I'm on a, I want to believe that was true, but his way of working was to write very fast. And in fact, when he was finished, when you look, um, when you see the signed manuscript that is now in um, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, British, museum, British, British Museum. Museum in London, um, it is filled with scratches out and, and um, measures that are empty and all the kinds of things. Sure. And Jensen kept saying, you know, I think you need to go back and look at this, this, and this. And he said, oh no, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> now, um, so anyway, this this uh, original manuscript is kind of a mess, but uh, wouldn't you love to be able to look at that yeah, mess? Yeah, I mean, you can, <laughs> you can see they show, uh, if you Google it, you can see like a page of it. It's oh, just I know. a little one page, but it's really not in um, the easiest thing to no. look at. It's not in the best shape. And probably because it wasn't in that great shape then. Absolutely not. <laughs> you know, so. And it was 259 pages. Yeah, so how many pages a day is that if you write it in 24 days? I, don't, uh, I, I believe that, that I read I mean, that he goodness. wrote part one in like eight days. And then he just you know continued with it. Yeah, this is like with Ink and, ink. Oh and my quill. Gosh. I quill and ink, yes. <laughs> you know? On parchment paper, I guess, or and whatever then, they use. And then you yeah. think about how did they get the, the instrumental parts out from that? I, it is a mind-boggling task. Yeah, I know. I, 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 I don't know if there was other people like here, now take this and yeah. copy out the trumpet part or, you know, it what, I, I don't know. It, did he have a staff? He, you wonder, there must have been uh, uh, some underlings to, yeah. to help with some of that, Hobbyist. I don't know. But anyway, so it's in three parts. The first part is essentially the birth, uh, the, the prophecy of Christ and of Messiah, the birth of uh, Messiah, the birth of Christ. Kind of Old Testament. Old Testament, mm -hmm. it actually I believe it follows Luke, and um, he followed Luke's uh, version of, of the Nativity. So, okay. Okay. In part one. In part one. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll get my make sure that I get my. Things I guess right. prophecy, the, uh, prophecy and the birth. That's right. Yeah. And right. we and the, the prophecy story. fulfilled. That's right. right. Yeah. You know, comfort ye. Yeah. Yeah. That one is is the okay. prophecy. And then the second is the is Christ's passion, death, resurrection, and ascension, and it also carries through with the first spreading of the gospel and um, a definitive statement of God's glory, which is where the Hallelujah Chorus comes in. So um, the second part, which is more about the passion of Christ and the um, spreading of the word after he is, uh, after the ascension, that's when the Hallelujah mm -hmm. Chorus comes. And it's uh, really the final victory over death. 
Um, so that, that's what that part is. And the third, I'm sorry, the third part is the promise of redemption, the day of judgment, general resurrection, and that is the final victory over death. So we've got, and it's pretty easy to understand. You have the birth of Christ, the prophecy, the birth of Christ in, the, in part one. You have the passion, the resurrection um, in part two. And finally, just the spreading the word of the gospel and the, the final victory over death hmm. in part three. Wow. And I, I, I should clarify, too, that um, it, it's a small detail, but it's just an interesting thing that, you know, that the, the title of the piece we're talking about is Messiah. Messiah. Yeah. Right. Not the Messiah. No, the. Yeah. It's and the same Messiah. with, it's not the Hallelujah Chorus no, either. It it's Hallelujah, hallelujah from Messiah. Messiah. Right. Yes. Yeah. And it's right, I, I printed out the score earlier, <laughs> a public domain version of the mm -hmm. score, and, and that's how it still is printed. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah from Messiah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. George Frederick Handel. So mm -hmm. there it is. Yeah. It was. And so, is there anything more to say about the whole work before we talk about the details of the um, movement that were the how how we part? I think it's interesting to know that when it was first scored, think about what this orchestra looks right. like now. It is two trumpets, a timpani, two oboes, two two violins, yeah, one viola, and probably a harpsichord. And I was telling you that didn't surprise me at all I because know, it's like, some of the uh, te from teaching orchestra mm -hmm. on occasion we would do pieces by hand. Mm -hmm. Alexander Spies is one of them. Mm -hmm. It's written for strings and oboe, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, harpsichord. Yeah. So um, yeah, so I'm not you know a lot of the, the pieces I've come across either in college when when I was playing mm -hmm. in ensembles or whatever they were they were small. Um, instrumentations the two trumpet thing very typical mm -hmm. two two violins whatever a, a handful of people mm -hmm. um and that's probably a good thing i mean that you know I, i'm yeah. thinking that's a good thing for a lot of reasons first of all it's a great instrumentation mm -hmm. those are bright instruments that can really do glory mm -hmm. you know well mm -hmm. and so but you don't need a lot of players uh to do it um you know so you're not having to pay too many musicians and space. Um, you, you know, it's going to be for your choir. You have the choir to worry about, mm -hmm. but instrumentally, it's it's not too hard to to do that. And also, I'm thinking of the music itself. The Baroque music is so busy and intricate that it probably is just so much better and more clear with fewer instruments on those parts, don't you think? Does that have something to do with it? I don't, I don't think it, it hurts. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to imagine, lighter. you know, like how many days would have it added to the 24 days if he had been writing for oh, yeah. some kind of large, yeah. you know, many instrument thing, if he had had clarinets and French horns and all kinds of stuff in it. Um, it's a very, I think, a very typical Baroque instrumentation. Um, and I also, uh, well, I guess we'll talk about the premiere of it late in a few minutes, but he continuously in those first performances was rewriting stuff. And he would, he would change the key of, of a, an aria just because a certain singer was singing it that day. You know, so it, it, was, it was constantly being revived. Yeah. Well, and that's what you do. I totally get that. I know. <laughs> How often do we do that? Yeah, and to the to the point where sometimes that's why you why you become a composer is because maybe you're the well maybe you're the choir director mm -hmm. you know or something and maybe you don't have any tenors. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, you can't find a piece written without tenor, so, okay, I'll write one myself, mm -hmm. or I'll arrange one myself. So, sometimes composition comes out of just, uh, just the need, need to yeah. write for what's in front of you. Mm -hmm. So, this week we're doing Messiah with this person, and they have this vocal range, yeah. but next week we're doing it over here, Isn't and maybe fun, I need to redo this a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But how, um, how, uh, there was no published work at this time when sure. he was doing all this, so... Um, he had. It was. He was like, in control. He was in control during his progress. lifetime. He yeah. had total control, as far as we know. He was the only one that ever conducted That's it right. in his lifetime. That's right. 
And she told me, when was it first published? After he died? Eight years after he died. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, it's, it's interesting. And when it was published, it was not with all of his revisions. They took some form of it that was earlier and probably didn't have the, the same revisions. But you know, I know there are musicologists that have gone back and um, looked at this and come up with um, a, a definitive uh, score that probably includes the most important things. Mm -hmm. um, and we won't get into that, but, yeah. um, <laughs> but I just found it so interesting to read how many times he, he, they performed it and he changed it and all that kind of stuff. It has, has quite a history of, um, of just tweaking. Yes, well, and so, so we kind of talked a little bit about the wider mm -hmm. Messiah itself, and so we come to the end of part two, mm -hmm. and Hallelujah Chorus, what we know now as Hallelujah Chorus, is, is the end of the second movement, not the Christmas part. No. I mean, you know, we kind of think of the part one as being the Christmas part no, no. of yeah. Messiah, yeah, right. and part two is this, this so-called Easter part, Easter part right? and that's the part that actually had Hallelujah Chorus. That's so why I say I would talk about it now at Easter. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, I think, associate it more with Christmas because over the years of popularity, if you do any kind of performance of Messiah, they just take that Hallelujah Chorus and put, and it, put it, and in that's going to be the end no matter what part mm -hmm. of Messiah you're doing. Yeah, and yeah. we talked, uh, I have never um, associated Hallelujah Chorus with Christmas especially. Not me either. I know the You know where thing. it was really come, came from. But uh, this is might be a good time to say that each chorus in Messiah can stand on its own. And, yes. it, and it does all the yeah, time. Yeah, and they're just as appealing and fun to sing or play mm -hmm. or listen to mm -hmm. as Holly is. Yes, and remember we talked with Judas Maccabeus that mm -hmm. I, I had sung so many of the choruses mm -hmm. from that piece. It's the same way with Messiah. Yeah. Those choruses are, are, they can stand on their own. They do not need to be put into context really. Right. Stand on their exactly. Uh, uh, a lot of um, choirs sing a chorus. Maybe they're having some kind of concert, mm -hmm. and so uh, you know they're not going to do the whole Messiah work, but they're going to take one of those really fun choruses, mm -hmm. and you know you can purchase just oh, sure. that chorus, yeah. and you can rehearse it and sing with your choir. And, yeah. You know, so um, and it has just as much importance standing right. on its own. It does. Yeah. So they are. They, that's a good comment. Mm -hmm. um, we don't need the whole Messiah to be inspired by any one of these true. these parts, yeah. any smaller parts of it. It's very true. Yeah. So um, when he when he actually was writing the Hallelujah part. Um, and I assume he wrote in order, like, you know, I don't know how he was writing, did he? Well, if you think you know, he has the libretto, so he's Yeah, he's I mean, writing. you know, probably he's writing in order and not so. skipping around too much. So now he's come to this hallelujah part, mm -hmm. which is this big moment of acknowledgement of the resurrection. And so, um, you know, there nobody was really there. We can't fact check yeah. what kinds of stories have been handed down through the ages, but there is um, some evidence, some handed down um, accounts of, of his mindset when he was working on this part. Um, he is said to have somewhat of a spiritual epiphany at the mm -hmm. time that he was writing this part of the of Messiah. Um, he is said to have had a vision of the throne room of God. And this is a quote that possibly came from him. It says, and I saw it in a couple different sources. I did think I did see all heaven before me and the great God himself. Mm -hmm. And um, then in response to that vision or feeling or attachment to the libretto in front of him and just being moved by it, however it took place, he drenches the chorus with 42 hallelujahs oh, and, yeah. and, and I haven't fact checked that either mm -hmm. but I know there's a lot of them mm -hmm. and I'm going to trust that the 42 mm -hmm. is the number um, that's a lot of hallelujah mm -hmm. oh, uh, yeah. going on which, um, which really I think comes more from the structure of the music than anything 
the way he, the polyphony and the music and, and how he wrote it. But uh, but still, it's it's a cool fact. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And again, I'm going to just throw this in. It's a in. fun word too. Of course, it's it a is. fun word. And as a singer, it's the greatest yeah. word. Hallelujah! Oh, oh, yes, yeah. a good one to sing. <laughs> it's a good vowel. Yeah, good vowel all the vowels, all the tall vowels. <laughs> but I want to say also that what I when I was doing my reading, the article that I read kind of poo pawed that that um, moment of. Uh, wow, this is like the, the throne of God, um, and said that he always wrote fast. And, and well, I don't think it had anything to do with writing fast, though. Okay. It's, it, they, they it was just being, that. you know, if you're in a fervor, you have this, well, like we were talking about when, you, when you're writing from a text that's sacred, mm -hmm. if you believe that yeah. sacred text, you, you are have, inspired. first of all, you have a, a huge responsibility to bring as much integrity to it as you can mm -hmm. as a composer. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I know you're a businessman too. You've got a few, you, you're trying to get it out because yeah. you need to make money to, per, you know, to pay for it. So you're balancing business with responsibility, mm -hmm. you know, but I don't think you can write with that sacred libretto in front of you without being moved by it. And, I agree. And, um, so I, I don't really think it's fair just to say, you know, this didn't happen. I just think maybe we don't know the details of it. You know, we nobody don't. was, you know, it's hearsay. So but, it's been handed down. And I will say that at the end of the uh, signed manuscript, he in Latin wrote to God's glory. So mm -hmm. I think that, that your story, I want to believe a whole lot more than what I read in in the other one because I I agree it would be really hard to put that music out the way it is without um, being so inspired. Yeah, and I think the process when you when you take any of the choruses, but we'll, we're talking about Holly, you start to sing it, and as it unfolds, the the writing itself is so magnificent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's we we were talking earlier about the there's some of it's just straight. Homophon mm -hmm. homophonic mm -hmm. choral writing, like hymn book writing, mm -hmm. that's straightforward. It's just part general part writing that, oh, wow. that but then it choral writing. Thank mm -hmm. you. I was trying to find the word. <laughs> and um, but then there's uh, all of his life experience surfaces in this piece. Mm -hmm. He he knew how to write um, fugue style. Mm -hmm which is what we associate with the Bach period, or, or where is, in, in, in a simple way to yeah. say a fugue is somebody starts to sing Ferrejaca and then part two sings the next Ferrejaca and part three, it's much more sophisticated it's than that. It's much more, yeah, but, but still. But it's like, it's a lot of busy stuff. There's a part, and now another part, and another part, and they're not all doing the same rhythm at the same time. The polyphony. The yeah, right. exactly, mm -hmm. and so there's, and so, this starts going, and he starts doing this with the word hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah, and it's, um, it's um, you know, just magnificent. It propels it forward so it, Right, it has so an energy much, about yeah, it. Energy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, um, and, and you know, at, we are assuming that you, our audience, knows the hallelujah chorus. I mean, we don't really need to... Um, inform you what happens with Hallelujah Chorus, but you might not think about when it becomes more like a chorale or, or when it is, uh, you hear all these. You might not know what it is when you hear all of those different parts coming There's in. even some unison in there. Uh huh. Yeah. You know, I mean, the strong, he just, the... he uses, he pulls out all yeah. the different things you can do mm -hmm. when you write. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the bum, 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 bum. That's all. That's a unison um, yeah. stuff there going and on. It's, and <laughs> the words are for our Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Right. right. And so why not put it in unison? That's like, right. I think yeah. it's so cool. I, yeah, I, it's good stuff. I love it. And how can you ever, ever get tired of singing Alleluia Chorus? You they can, can't. Yeah. So um, he, he wrote this. Um, the opening performance was, he was born in 1685. So now we're talking about 1742. Mm -hmm. um, he's already, you know, he's been through half of his life now, you know. And um, 
he um, they, they had the opening performance on April 13th of 1742. So this is Easter, mm -hmm. Easter time. Uh, he the 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 reason Messiah came about was a, a kind of a cool thing. It was sort of a turning point part of his life where he had he had actually had he didn't have a, a lot of stress in his life, but he had a short period of three or four years where uh, some of the operas hadn't gone well and he had invested his own money into this opera company mm -hmm. that uh, the Italian opera was starting to wane That's I guess mm -hmm. and um, so he lost money and mm -hmm. and um, so it was so serious his, his debt was serious he was almost thrown in prison for his debt mm -hmm. and he also had some health problems at that time stress and I'm so sure. he had, you know he had been associated with uh, writing for royalty and the uppity ups mm -hmm. And so he had, had this different sort of life experience where he himself was close to being in you know, debt and, and, and struggling with his own health. He had a stroke, I think. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, he, um, he started to, uh, you know, Jen, Jennings, Jennings was associated with him and was, um, they decided to write this, but um, he, they'd been approached by, um, people in, in Ireland, in Dublin, who uh, wanted him to write a work, an oratorio, I think specifically mm -hmm. they asked for an oratorio, that would be for the public, mm -hmm. more for the public rather than the aristocracy, mm -hmm. and it was a fundraiser. Yeah, it was a fundraiser. They used it for a fundraiser, and it was to help people, help men get out of debtor's prison. Debtor's prison, at, for Mercy, Mercer's Hospital, and for charitable, and for and for hospital, hospital yeah. and there were two hospitals, yes. I think, that were mm -hmm. benefiting in addition to the debtors. And I, I understand and there's 142 debtors that were released because of the funding. Can that you they imagine raised. putting people in debt? How are they supposed to get out of debt? I know. I mean, we don't, I mean, everybody, we would have no one well, left here in the United States because everybody's in debt. That is <laughs> such a, a terrible thing. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, that's why it was written. So, I mean, that's a far cry from here you are writing the first half of your life for the aristocracy and yeah. maybe not really even realizing, you know, this other part of life where, mm -hmm. you know, people are struggling. And, and so he went through this period of, uh, fortunately for him, not too much mm -hmm. uh, length of time, but this was a real turning point in just his outlook mm -hmm. on purpose, why we write, you know, who we write for, and um, I think there was no turning back after this for him. I mean, he really had his attention more towards public mm -hmm. versus aristocracy. And again, it, we have to also note that the English <coughs> language-based pieces were becoming much more popular, and um, we mentioned before that the Italian opera was becoming passe, so there was that part of it mm -hmm. too. But um, I do believe his focus definitely shifted at this point. Yeah, and and the fact that it premiered in Dublin, and I also oh it wasn't in a church either. No, uh, -uh. <laughs> and so that was a big deal with a lot of yeah. people. They thought it's a very exalted work and why would you not be doing it in a church he got some flack for that mm -hmm. and again what I think we said earlier you know this this premiere was a huge success it was in a music concert hall yes basically. Mm -hmm. yeah because they wanted a lot of people to be able to to hear it um, but again it was many performances and he tweaked it and it depended on who was singing the solos and but it was very successful there. And I, I had the impression it was like uh, like a, a messiah run. Mm -hmm. So it was like it wasn't just a one night no, thing. Right. It was for a length of time that right. people were coming and it, the excitement built in the town and everybody had to go see it. It's like and okay, it was very this, popular. This is the last performance night of the Handel's <laughs> Messiah. Yeah. Right. So you know, so, make sure you, and and I also was um, intrigued by the fact they said that some of the students were selling their furniture so they had enough money to buy the fifteen whatever thing ticket so they could go here. Yeah, it's, it, you know, it's, right. it's really popular. So timeline wise, um, this was after Judas. Right? Judas was a knight in 1726. So, I mean, he was already writing oratorios 
before Messiah, what was different about this one was the whole, the per, you know, it was written for as a fundraiser, mm -hmm. and so he already had success. Mm -hmm. He was already respected. This was in, um, uh, oh, oh yeah, okay, so the, the public, the um, premiere was in, what year? So it? it was 1742? 1740, okay. What did I just say? Yeah. So yeah, right. 17, Easter of 1742. Yeah, he had, he had written Messiah before Judas Maccabeus, yes. Mm -hmm. No, other way around. 1746 was Judas Maccabeus. Was it? Mm-hmm. So this, so then this was the turning point. This is what propelled us? Um, I think so. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, but anyway, I, but I don't, I, I think he was already successful mm -hmm. to some degree. Oh, yeah. You know, he had other oratorios that were it's successful many. by that time. Yeah, many. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but quite a few, and quite a few that he had written with Jen, Jennings also. Right. Yeah. 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 And they'd had some failures, too. That was the mm -hmm. thing. That's why, you know, that they, they, was the kind of the tail end of the mm -hmm. Italian opera thing going on. and Trying to find you know, a niche there. Yeah, <laughs> right. And the oratorios were kind of what were eventually going to save them. Mm -hmm. You know, they both, they both you know, prospered then with mm -hmm. the success of the form of the oratorios That's right. versus the, the opera. So anyway, um, you know, he, he continued to be, well, a year later, um, you know, it, it was in Ireland originally and then it mm -hmm. came back to London and that's for King George II. The premiere in London a year later, March, which we're getting into the Easter season again there, um, and um, King George is in attendance. And so they say. They're not quite really sure. Well, I the think he was probably goes. there. I, don't, I, don't, I think it's probably well documented he was probably there. Yeah. But the story goes, you know, if you've ever wondered why people stand during the Messiah, the singing of Messiah, or the, the, not the whole Messiah, but the whole well, chorus right. part, mm -hmm. um, the story goes that King George II stood mm -hmm. while this was being sung, and uh, when in Rome you do as the Romans do, I guess. So if the king stands, stands you stand. everyone stands. <laughs> And so that became the tradition of standing during Hallelujah Chorus, which mm -hmm. we still, today, we still if you do. have a crowd that understands that tradition, mm -hmm. you'll still see that. And, you know, it just feels good to do that. It I does. Think, <clears throat> I think partly it's because of the tradition of it, partly because you want to honor such a magnificent piece. That's it. And, the, and honor the meaning of the words, you know, so it's it's all that. It and is all those it's, things. Um, I mean, we don't know anything about that. Is such a hearsay tale. No one really knows. But it, we still know? do it. And if he did stand up, we don't know why he stood up. Right. We, you know, no, <laughs> was he inspired by the music? Well, why that, and not the other choruses he had already heard. Mm -hmm. You know, but. Um, but, or was, it, some people say maybe he, it was like, hey, this was the end of the second act. He'd been sitting for a long time. Maybe he just wanted to stretch, you know? So, I mean, first of all, did he do it? And if he did do it, why did he do it? We don't really know. But, but it has perpetuated. It doesn't really matter. It's a, it's a great story. Um, I used to share it with my kids. We would do it for concerts, the yeah. Hallelujah portion. and. Um, you know, with band, orchestra, whoever. It's, a, it's, it's arranged, it's just not always for chorus, it can be done instrumentally. And, um, you know, so I, I enjoy always telling my kids that story. Um, and, but, but, and wondering if anyone in the audience would, would know, know enough to, to do it. To stand you know. up. <laughs> I went to, uh, this is a brief aside, I went to the um, candlelight service that they have at Epcot, you know, and they mm -hmm. invite choirs to come in. And they sing the Hallelujah Chorus, and I, I was up in front, I don't know, and I, and I wondered myself, you know, but I stood up, and lo and behold, everybody else stood up, and this was Disney. How about that? It was Disney. Good for you, Barbara. But I said, you know what, <laughs> I'm going to stand up, and I, I don't know whether that started it, or whether just one person stood up. Right, yeah, remember. somebody has to be brave, I yeah. guess, you know. Well, I, I will be brave for you. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, and it, you know, t to that end, I mean, true or not true, um, it's a wonderful tradition that's sort of made this a universal anthem. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that's really awesome. You know, we so have too. a piece that connects the world in a special way like I, that, yeah, that we right. all agree mm -hmm. upon this tradition. Mm -hmm. And we all have this mutual respect society mm -hmm. for Handel and history and, and this beautiful quality, yeah. you know, religion and all the stuff. I think know? it works. So, yeah. So, but what's even more remarkable is, you know, now we, we've, he he does he continues the next decade performing Messiah and all of his other things that he's doing and still tweaking it yeah time. exactly mm -hmm. um, it, this isn't the only thing he has going on it's just now it's written so mm -hmm. but but still being asked to perform it well in in 1753 um, by this time he's gone blind mm -hmm. and uh, but he's continuing to compose and write and conduct people loved him. You know, they just really revered him by this time of his life. And so, so now he's blind, but it, so he goes a few more years. In April of 1759, it's Easter again. Right. Easter season. And he's doing Messiah. He collapses during a performance of the Messiah. And um, this was the beginning of the end for him. He uh, supposedly said he would like to die on Good Friday, but he died early Easter morning. <laughs> that was 1759. So, you know, this Messiah thing, he it's really tied to Handel and Easter, you know, personally for him. Um, you know, these Easter uh, anniversaries for him where he would come back and be doing Messiah. Um, I don't know, somehow it seems appropriate to me mm -hmm. that, you know, he was born with Bach and he died on Easter mm -hmm. with, you know, uh, in the midst of the Messiah production yeah. that he was involved in, so I think that's amazing. It's really quite, quite um, uh, memorable and poignant and yeah. all those good things, yeah. So on his epitaph, mm -hmm. um, well, I, I don't know, I, I saw this quote, this is, I don't know if this is, is this epitaph, if it's somewhere, you know, he's buried in Westminster, mm -hmm. in the, what the like, artists and poets mm -hmm. corner there, and um, there's an amazing, he picked out this monument for himself, and uh, it shows him holding a scroll with the music to the little part of Messiah, I know that my Redeemer loveth, this gorgeous Beautiful part. Beautiful aria. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, he, he wanted that specific um, motif of the music to be on the scroll and it's it's there. It's perfect. And it's an amazing sculpture piece of art that's uh, where he's, he's buried there. And um, this is written about him. I, I it's not, not visible in this picture that we have of him, but um, I, this is written, written as sort of an epitaph about him. It says he's the most excellent musician any age ever produced whose compositions were a sentimental language rather than mere sounds, and surpassed the power of words in expressing the various passions of the human heart. Wonderful. That's a great, that's just uh, why we do music right there. Mm -hmm. I love the power. Surpass the power of words in expressing the various passions of the human heart. Right. So that's what it's all about as yeah. writer. He was very respected by Beethoven and Mozart. Both had, you know, accolade quotes uh, about Handel. They were later, they were later composers looking back at Handel. But at, that, at the time that he passed away in 1759, this is, this is what people thought of him. Mm -hmm. Bravo to him. Yeah, a lot of composers don't have the luxury of being appreciated in their lifetime mm -hmm. so much. And that's but right. I think he really, and he I was. think he really was yes. uh, He was appreciated mm -hmm. in, in Britain. For sure, and, and later, you know, throughout the world. But um, all you have to do is sing a little handle to understand why. Yep. We still do. Uh, I said to Barbara earlier. I said, said if if I get a piece of music in front of me and it says handle at the top, I'm okay with that. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> me too. I, yeah. It's just you just know that you just know that it's going to be engaging. You know that it's it's going to be rewarding mm -hmm. to. Um, you know, engage in it, you with, know, with and um, yeah. so, yeah, and that's not always true, mm -hmm. you know, even with some of the greatest composers, I, you know, I, I have to say I'm not, I'm not always 
sold on every single thing they do. No, you right. know. But and um, you know, with handle, I just like oh, okay, it's handle. It's going to be okay. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, those choruses and those arias are magnificent. Yeah. For sure. So. so we'll put a link uh, for uh, you to be able to listen once again to um, Messiah and not the, not the whole Messiah, but how the chorus mm -hmm. and. Um, We'll go from there. Yeah. Well, yeah. I hope you learned a little bit more yeah. about where it comes from and um, how important it is. Yeah. And we'll see it. We'll see you next time on Music Chat. Bye. Bye.